On today's episode, we're going to cover the best practices for user experience and user interface and how to apply them on your next web design. Stay tuned. Hey, everybody. What is up? If you're new here to the channel, my name is Ron Segal. And here on Flux, we're talking about everything that's got to do with web design, design in general, and freelancing. So if you're new here, make sure you're subscribed. We have videos dropping three times a week on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. On today's video, we're going to cover the best practices. And the way that we're going to do this is by showing you some good examples and bad examples. So let's start with UX, user experience. Basically, we're going to talk about two things here. The first one is navigation and making sure that people actually understand where they are on the website. Let's let's get started with a good example. So here we have Apple's website. Okay, it's easy to show Apple as a good example, but you see here, you have the navigation. And if let's say we're going to go into Mac, for example. So first of all, when we're in Mac, you can see that the navigation here is marked a little bit differently. I would say that it's pretty minor here. You can see the Mac is gray versus all the other ones are you know, white. And also you have obviously here, you have the Mac sub navigation um, and obviously types of Macs. And if you would pick one of them here, then you now can see that you're within Mac and you have kind of a sub menu that says MacBook Pro. And if you're going to scroll down, that kind of navigation is going to stick with you. So you always know where you are on the website. You're now on a page that's called MacBook Pro. So now this is a good type of navigation that uses the main navigation for the website and then a sub navigation and also keeps you in track on what page you are. Now, let me show you an example where this doesn't happen. So here we have the National Vehicle Solution, basically a website for leasing cars. And besides the fact that it's a little bit overwhelming here, um, let's see if we pick something in the navigation. Let's say we go to leasing guides, we click this gap insurance. Now, First of all, it doesn't look like nothing happened, but let's click funding options. All right, now I'm in a different page, but actually I have no clue where I am, right? None of this, the navigation here is marked such as the to show me what page I'm at, right? There is uh, some kind of a title here, not that big and noticeable, but if I scroll down, I still have no clue right now where I am on the website. Let's try something else, maybe special offers. All right, so notice that now that we click special offers, they do use something here that is called breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs is actually a good practice sometimes when you have complicated website to show you the structure. So basically it means that there's the homepage and under that we are right now on the page that's called car special offers. But I don't know why it sometimes it shows you Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work on this website. So obviously that's not really a good practice, but you can see why it can be a little bit confusing. So again, what I want you to take away from this is that something that is very important is that the function of the navigation is to first show us what's actually available for us on the website. It wants to show the visitor, hey, you can learn more about this and this and that. But also you have to remember people are not going to stay on the homepage forever. Sometimes they won't even start from the homepage. Maybe somebody linked to an inner page of the website. So the navigation is the tool that shows somebody, you know, where they are on the website to give them a little bit of context. Here on this website, it's not done very, very well. All right, let me jump into the second point in terms of best practices for user experience. And that is the copy, and I mean copywriting, the text that you have on certain uh, places, specifically on buttons on the website. You want your buttons to be very, very clear so that people know, you know that when you click a certain button, what's going to happen. Otherwise, if they're confused or if they're not sure, they might hesitate and they end up not purchasing, not clicking or not doing what you actually want them to do. So I went back here to the Apple website and you can see here that they say buy or learn more. It's pretty straightforward, right? But let me go here. Okay, here's another website. This is a website of a graphic design services in, uh, I don't know, Portland, Maine. All right. So here... First of all, this website has a lot of problems when it comes to, you know, when it comes to hierarchy, but uh, you can go back and watch the video on hierarchy and realize why there's problems here. But when I look at the buttons that they have here, 
One of them is shop, shop or online store. Okay, sounds pretty straightforward. The other one says idea search. What does idea search mean when you're in a website for a graphic design? What will happen if I click this? I don't really know and that's confusing. So that's a bad thing. You don't want to do, let me see if I click this, it actually opens up a new website and takes me somewhere else to some kind of a product. I have no clue what I'm seeing right now. So this is confusing, right? You don't want, you want to give people context about what's going to happen and why are you even sending them to there. So the second best practice you need to remember, be very, very clear with the names of either pages, buttons, or sections on your website because you want to make sure that people understand what they're reading right now, where they are, and what's going to happen if they're going to click a certain button. All right, I want to move into UI, user experience, and talk about how can we make sure that we're, again, not confusing people and telling them the right thing to do. So one thing I want to talk about is how, how buttons look like, okay? So if you go back here, you know, and we look at how do we know that some things are buttons, all right? So obviously, you know, some in the navigation, we, we know that usually these are buttons and when we go over them we get the cursor to change its its cursor to kind of a fingery and then we also get in this case kind of an interaction and hover interaction something changes and basically it tells us that this is a button but in a more um in a more visible way here in these buttons they are a different color so we kind of know that when something is a different color it might be linkable and then we maybe try to hover it so in this case everything that's blue is also a button if we're going over into this website although it has a lot of problems you can clearly see that these are the buttons right because they are kind of like you know they have kind of a border either they're within a box or or something like that however this also has something that's a little bit confusing here, right? Because here we have blue text that is a button and then blue text that isn't the button, right? Here, this 500. So this is confusing. You don't want to do something that tells a different story or that has different functions in different contexts because you want to teach your, your visitor in the website what does what. And if sometimes blue text is a link and sometimes blue text isn't a link, that's kind of confusing, right? So you want to have some kind of a consistent way of explaining what does what. Now, again, let's go back here. It's kind of obvious that these are buttons because they have this, you know, the border. But then again, there's also kind of blue text, black text here. And I already know because I visit a lot of websites and here blue, blue text was linked. Here sometimes blue text was linked. And here blue text is not a link. So why did they just change the color, right? Every All the text is black and here it's blue. So again, this is a little bit confusing. You have to stay in context that, you know, people are browsing different different websites. And there are all these kind of markers, such as when a text is in a box, it's usually a button. When a text is blue, a lot of times it would be a button or it's just a different color than black. If it's not black, maybe it's a color. If it's underlined, maybe it's a color. So you have to keep these things in mind. You're not designing your website in a vacuum without context from other websites. People are visiting, you know, they're crossing, crisscrossing or jumping between different websites. So you need to keep that in mind and you want to make sure that you design your website in a way that's very, very consistent and does not confuse them okay let's let's check out another website and this is a website another graphic design service here we have something a little bit weird that we have here we're here to help then there is a button that says get quote and then get in touch and then call us now so there is three basically call to actions these ones are buttons but this is not a button and in this case i'm i'm confused just because i think i have a lot of possibilities. Now it's okay to have multiple calls to action, but then you want to kind of create hierarchy within them, right? And we talked about this in the video between hierarchies. You want to make one of them primary and the second one secondary because when we have two of them and actually this this tells me something else, I'm a little bit confused. Should I get a quote or should I get in touch or should I call you now? And if I call you now, this is not clickable. So how do I even call you now? So this is something that's again, too confusing. I have too many options. Some of them look the same. Some of them don't function the way that I expect them to function. And this is a little bit confusing. On this website, Fetch Design, 
I'm trying to look here. Where is the call to action? And I'm and I scroll the way to the end. And then I see get in touch, and then there's the name and then their email. Now I'm trying to click the get in touch because it looks a little bit different, but this is obviously not a button. This is also not a button. This is also not a button. This is a button. All right. So the email is actually a button, but look, it doesn't look any different from any other thing. How would I know that this is a button? Now, mind you, I'm on desktop, so I'm you know moving around my my cursor looking for what's clickable, but imagine this website on mobile. I wouldn't even imagine that something is clickable and I have no kind of indication, visual indication that this is clickable. So this is, again, not a good practice. You wanna make sure that things that are clickable they look clickable and they look like a button if you want people to click them. All right, so I think that kind of sums up the, the thing, <laughs> the, the principle in user experience where we're saying that you want things to look the way that they behave so that they don't confuse. Mostly we're talking about buttons here. The last principle that I wanna cover in terms of you know, user interface is contrast. A lot of times people would just put elements with lacking contrast. Let me show you an example. So this website has the biggest text here on an image and it's a white text on a white mountain. So there is no contrast here which makes reading this text very, very difficult. In general, also having just busy images like here in the back background is kind of a bad practice because it makes reading the text very hard. But just in terms of contrast, we have here white on white, which is very, very difficult. Let me open up a different one. So here we have also kind of purple on bluish purple. So the contrast here is very, very low, which just makes it kind of fuzzy in the eye and not really, not really nice to look at. You can actually, you know, lose that because you don't see it. And also we have kind of a gray on gray here. So here, even though they try to create contrast by adding kind of a black overlay on top of the image, um, which usually helps if you want to. So here, imagine the snow is white. It, it actually, and we turned it into gray. So there is enough contrast when the text is big and white. However, here we have small text, which also is not really white. It's kind of a grayish and it's on a grayish snow. So here we have a problem of contrast and readability. So that's one more thing that you wanna make sure that the, you know, the, the UI that you create or all the elements on the page has significant contrast so that people can actually look at it and read it and the website is useful. All right, I hope this was helpful. Make sure you watch this next video here in our course to keep learning about web design and we'll see you there.